Hey everybody, welcome to Talk Gnosis. This is part three of three of our conversation with Clark Aitkins on the Gospel of Mary. And we talk about the nature of sin in the Gospel of Mary and also of the passions. We'll talk a little bit about Greek philosophy and how Greek philosophers saw the early Christians. It's a very interesting kind of take on it. And uh, we'll talk about some modern applications of the Gospel of Mary and how we can put it to use in our daily life. You're not going to want to miss it. Stay tuned coming up on Talk Gnosis. What does, what does the Gospel of Mary say about sin, uh, Clark? Well, um, so it's pretty interesting, of course. The Savior teaches in the Gospel of Mary in a discussion about the reality of matter and what will happen to matter. Um, he says that uh, there is actually no sin, and then he says that sin seems to be born of what you do whenever you partake of things that are like adultery, when you are doing things that you're not supposed to be doing, when you're not keeping true to your nature. There's different ways to interpret this. Um, so there is sin, but there isn't sin. Mm -hmm. He says specifically there is no sin, but then again he goes on saying that it is born of you acting contrary to how you're supposed to behave or feel or, or whatever. Um, so it, I, I'd say, I would argue it's a little bit ambiguous, but there is a point where the Savior does come straight out and say it isn't, there is no sin. In fact, I can find it right here. Um, um, there is no such thing as sin, rather you yourselves are what produces sin when you act in accordance with the nature of adultery, which is called sin. It's clear as day. It's totally clear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, and how about uh, like the passions? Oh, well, the idea of the passions, of course, I mean, so the ancient Greek philosophers felt that the passions were a negative thing, a very bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't strictly just a, a thing that a lot of people like to fault Christianity with, but that's is pre-existed Christianity by a long time. And a lot of the ancient Greek uh, schools of philosophy, Stoicism, etc., um, were very much about taking on spiritual practices to remove your uh, connection to your passions mm -hmm. and to live a life that would have been, that Plato, I think, would have described as being very close to death. Mm. Um, and so you overcame your passions in order to conquer yourself, to prepare yourself for death, so that you would know what happened, what's happening when you died. Um, so conquering these passions would probably be very close to doing things like conquering your wrath and your mm -hmm. desire and your ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that simple. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's a, simply put, a simple put. But, you know, it's interesting because they, I mean, philosophizing in the ancient world wasn't just something you got together in the agora and you started yapping at each other like we're doing now. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was a way of life. And when you joined a school, you did have to do these practices and you had to go through a series of, you know, stepping up and stepping up and, and you mm -hmm. know, everything, you know. Uh, you had, part of the, pra uh, the spiritual practices was to memorize and put into action the core tenets of your philosophy. You didn't get to really get to a point of, very few people got to a point of debating the mm. fine points of their philosophy and coming up with their own philosophy. That was something you kind of had to earn the right to do. And a lot of uh, Christian apologists felt that Christianity was the world's premier philosophy be specifically because it adopted the practice of these spiritual practices. Of, of getting people into adopting spiritual practices to overcome their passions, to become better Christians, and to initiate themselves or to get into an initiatory process of moving themselves up mm. in the church or in their, in their religious life. Um, so the connection there is actually very, very strong. And you can, like, you can see that in the Gospel of Mary, that whole process going on, I think. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that that, I mean, you don't see that, you don't see much of that in modern Christianity today. Uh, Yes, that's, <laughs> I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, just another example of how <laughs> people think Christianity is as it has always been, but right, that's right, not right. true how, at all. Well, yeah, it, early Christianity is, well, early Christian practitioners would be foreign to modern Christian practitioners. Right. I'm, I'm convinced of it, yeah. They wouldn't, rec they wouldn't recognize each other at all. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that reminds me of a joke, but I won't tell it now. Okay, okay. yeah, afterwards. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> Yeah, so you, you mentioned Orphism and Stoicism. What kind of uh, Platonism do you see in this text? Oh, well, of course, I mean, mostly I just see what we were talking about, um, where Plato got a lot of his ideas about what happens to the soul when it leaves the body. Um, that would have been a very, probably a very Orphic or Bacchic concept that would have been probably influenced even earlier by Eleusis. And this is these processes, these things that he talks about in his philosophy are one of the reasons why people think he was probably in initiated at Eleusis, among many reasons, but mm. among the fact that he was a leading Athenian 
citizen and it would have done that anyway just for yeah. because it was Athenian um, and spoke Greek. But yeah, some of these ideas seem to have worked their way into his philosophy. Um, so he seems to have had some spiritual experiences again before he started philosophizing and coming up with his own system. Mm -hmm. What do you what do you think that if um, let's say the community that used this text, what do you think that uh, what do you think that community looked like? Do you, was that a <laughs> now 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 I'm going to irritate some people. All right, let's do it. <laughs> this is something that I shy away from. <laughs> um, I'm not convinced that there was a community that used this. Oh, text. Okay, I. If there was, it, wouldn't have, it would have been something that we would have to use the word community very loosely to describe. So, okay, one, I don't think all of these texts that we're talking about in general had to have a community. I think it's, it's pretty feasible that a small group of people may have come up with them, or just a mm. person. Yeah, yeah. The texts weren't really written by a single people, by a single person at the time, but. Um, if you look into the text itself, you want to take hints from the text itself. The only community that we're talking about are the disciples, and they're being encouraged to scatter. Mm -hmm. So that's not really a community. Yeah. Now we're not really sure when in the timeline of Jesus' life and or resurrection this is happening. And this is an interesting uh, thought experiment. To stop for, as an aside, just stop and think for a second. Where, do, in your mind, do you visualize this conversation with the Savior happening? I guess I kind of always pictured it as a post-resurrection conversation. Yeah, and yeah. so have I, but where? Oh, I don't know. Where? Some people have seen it as being outside and not necessarily post-resurrection. I assumed, for some reason, well, I can guess a couple of reasons, I saw it as in the sealed-off room in John. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right? And that when he left, we're not told the details of how he left. He just bails. Yeah. So... I assumed he just, I don't know, jumps out a window onto a jet ski. And yeah, 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 or yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, rides a broom out. <laughs> so this is one of the, this is, it's interesting because this is, this is influenced by the assumptions that we're bringing to the right. text and sure. how we're going to interpret it. So what do we think of this community? Well, I mean, what happened to that community at that time? If this is post-resurrection text, there is no community. So within the text, there's no community. That doesn't necessarily mean there's no te community not around the text, but mm -hmm. I think that if there was a community around the text, it would have been it would have probably sprung up after the text was written. Maybe mm -hmm. it's not written in res doesn't necessarily I don't think have to be written in response to a community or because a community has come up with these ideas already because these ideas don't play to a community. Mm -hmm. They encourage strong individuals to go out and preach for the sake of preaching. You're not out converting the world for the sake of the world. Mm, You're doing it because it's part of your spiritual practice. I don't know. So maybe it's, it's, it was, it's just an idea that I'm playing with in my head. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. So maybe it was passed on from teacher to student kind of a thing? Yeah, maybe, yeah, uh, you know, mouth to ear, sort mm -hmm. of like the Kabbalah is supposed to have been done, or, you know, uh, from what I, the little that I understand of Zen Buddhist transmissions are like that, that sort of thing, possibly, yeah. Yeah, so if there was a community, maybe there was, it was just lineages of intimate teacher to student to passing. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe there was a lodge system, because I know uh, April DeConnick has talked a little bit about inner, right. inner lodge systems within larger church, churches within a community. But I'm not seeing that in the text, but I, I could be totally wrong. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course you wouldn't, we do read lodge systems into text and, and we can see evidence of them, but it, yeah. it doesn't necessarily have to be there, right? You're not always going to mention the lodge or the system. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, well, this paper that we were talking about before with this elaborate system of baptismal initiations, I right. mean, that's not it, something that just happens spontaneously. Right, it presupposes some uh, organization. So a serious yeah. amount of organization, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I see what you're saying. This could very easily be just a, you know, here's the practices, go do it. Yeah, yeah, because you don't need a community to tell people, calm down. <laughs> let's, let's chill out a little bit. Let's calm down, yeah, everybody. We don't, we, we don't have to tell each other what to do all the time. <laughs> but you don't need a community for that. Yeah. In fact, some of that, I would argue, might be counter-community. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the prescription against making new rules, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and you can see that, uh, again, even kind of leaving Gnosticism, but in, in what's happening in the wider Christian community, you know, the beginning of the uh, of the Desert Fathers and Desert Mothers, right? Where they, w which is an anti-community 
community of Christians yeah. in many yeah, ways. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, but I think you're right. Um, where they, they, they themselves as individuals split off from a community. Yeah. 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 So they can go a little bit deeper and really, really avoid bathing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, who doesn't want to really avoid bathing? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, wh what, what else is, do you find interesting about the text that we haven't talked about yet? Trick question. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, I guess, well, I mean, we have talked about some of the things I've been thinking about most recently with it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, how would you employ this in the modern world, mm. like these teachings in the modern world, and which is um, a thing that I'm particularly interested in? That's something I'd like to see possibly uh, put down into detail mm. um, because some special adaptations would have to be done because, um, I mean, I'm sorry, but the modern world does not adapt well to a bunch of crazy preachers just scattering across. I mean, it happens enough that people ignore it. I'm sorry, have you seen yeah. the internet? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I ignore them. If there's any Jehovah's Witnesses listening, and I'm sure there isn't, but if there are, here's the <laughs> I'm sure there isn't. <laughs> I think that's the same bet. Uh, oh, those guys love when they show up at my house. I'm always ready for them. Oh yeah, no, but I'll tag Jehovah's Witness in the in the uh, yeah. video description here, so <laughs> it'll make sure that it gets found. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I like that idea actually because I, I've done um, a similar thing. Well, I, I, I maybe not very successfully, but I've been thinking a lot about a similar thing with the uh, the Secret Book of John and oh uh, yeah I think that's a text that's asking for it too actually. absolutely yeah. yeah like I what what would a practice a, you know regular old you know sp everyday spiritual practice look like based mm -hmm. on that text and and um, I think it w there's a lot of asceticism happening I, I think that there's some kind of ascent uh, visionary ascent, you know, maybe, or maybe it's yeah, just... Yeah, but that ascent, that ascent process would be so detailed and complicated. Absolutely, and yeah, so you'd have to worry about all the individual names. Oh, yeah. my God, yeah, yeah. but it would. All, I wonder if you'd have to begin it like I was, well, we talked about this a little bit, uh, some sort of anointing ritual, but, yeah. the, I mean, you would just be, you would, you would be an oil slick at the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, in other words, a typical Friday night. Well, oh, yeah. well yeah. yeah, maybe uh, at your place. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, let's start to wrap things up here. Uh, okay. is, is there anything that um, is there anything that calls to you about this text uh, specifically that is different about uh, about it than than from some of the other Gnostic texts? If I could ask that question any more poorly, right? Um, and I'll answer it just as poorly. <laughs> um, really, the thing that calls to me is is it's. I really, really, really think that of all of them that I've read, these are this one, the Gospel of Mary, is most easily adaptable to the modern world, mm. um, yeah. especially the point that we're in today, um, with the emphasis on, you know, gender equality, a sexual equality, uh, individual equality, and um, all of that's in there because we're, we're emphasizing the Gospel of Mary that none of these things are a matter. What matters is that you're on that path, and that seems really rather important as 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 well as something that I think is a, an aspect to even modern day Christianity that could be emphasized a little bit more and my personal mm. not so humble opinion <laughs> perhaps. Um, and not just the morality of course but as we were talking about like the application of, of the way of life mm -hmm. um, and, and in spiritual practice. It's, it's as we have it of course sans the world's two largest and most frustrating lacunae. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's we have some basic general ideas that could be easily adapted. You wouldn't have to, you know, join a monastery to practice this. You don't have to do that. It wouldn't. It doesn't demand your entire life. I right. don't think. Mm -hmm. It just demands that. Well, it demands that you view your entire life in a different way yeah. and maybe change some of the things that you're doing. But it doesn't demand all of your time. It doesn't demand all of your energy and all of your wealth. Yeah. It's it's doesn't have anything to do with a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Very interesting. I wonder what those big gaps say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I spent. Uh, we have spent hours talking about the big I'm gaps. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 It, you, it's like the that um, that piece from Thomas where uh, uh, um, Thomas says, "Master, my mouth is utterly unable to uh, oh, to yeah, describe to what you're you like." Are, and yeah. then Jesus pulls him aside and tells him three words, and everybody's like, "What's the three words?" <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, all right, good stuff. Um, okay. I, there's a lot more to talk about, uh, and, and I look forward to the work that you're, uh, you're talking about doing with the, um, 
developing a spiritual, a modern spiritual practice out of uh, this text. I'd well, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to talk with people more about that and yeah. come up with some ideas. That would yeah. be interesting. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So email, email him, everybody. And, we'll <laughs> <laughs> and if, you, if you're interested in that, and we'll, we'll continue the conversation. Okay, great. Fantastic. All right, so Clark Aikens, thank you once yep. again for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you on and a pleasure to see you as always. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. I hope I didn't bore you guys too much. Um, cool. Never. <laughs> Never, yeah. Hi, everybody. That does it for our conversation with Clark Aitkins on the Gospel of Mary. I hope you liked it. If you did, please go on, go on over to patreon.com slash gnostic and become a supporter uh, if you're able to. It's just a small pledge uh, for every piece of content we put out, and you can, uh, you can put a monthly cap on it so you don't get surprised by how many things we might put out in a given month. Uh, and your support will help us grow and make new and better content. And we really appreciate everybody who's a supporter of, our, of ours on, on Patreon. So uh, also, wanna, you want to make sure to either subscribe to us on YouTube or on the uh, Gnostic Wisdom Network's uh, website, GnosticWisdom.net, if you want to get either the video or the, po the podcast versions of this particular content. Next week, we're, we've got a conversation about G.I. Gurdjieff, who is a uh, Christian mystic. Um, uh, super interesting character and uh, very closely related to Gnosticism. So you're not going to want to miss that. Go and subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you next week.